Uh, good evening all at home and abroad and welcome to this evening's activity which um, is special in many respects taking place first of all um, on the 29th of February uh, which is only comes around every four years um, also taking place on the first weekend after the end of a month of observances of St. Lucia's uh, 45th independence anniversary and uh, just a few hours after a uh, significant tribute was paid to a member of the National Reparations uh, Committee and on an evening when we will be launching uh, the first in a series of reparations lectures relating to our program for national consultation on reparations, which was launched on the 22nd of November last year at the Castries City Hall, um, at which we indicated that as of the period after New Year and Independence, we would be launching our monthly series, which will start this evening, uh, we didn't advertise it as this evening, but um, you are uh, participating in the historic first, wherever you are. And um, this evening, we will be making a special uh, presentation, which will be repeated uh, not in uh, form and format, uh, but in terms of thematic follow-up having to do with the uh, struggle for uh, the continuing struggle for reparations and the fact uh, that it is now 10 years since uh, the Caribbean community, CARICOM, uh, has been striving uh, to make a case for reparations for, from Europe for slavery and native genocide in the Caribbean. And to uh, welcome us this evening, after having put this evening in perspective, I'd like to um, call on the head of the local UWI Global Campus, um, also a member of the National Reparations Committee, and uh, please welcome Leslie Crane Mitchell. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and a special welcome to Monsignor Dr. Patrick Anthony, who is here with us this evening. I would also like to specially acknowledge the online presence of Her Excellency Dame Paulette Louisi, who is not only a founding member of our National Reparations Committee, but who was honored earlier today, as our chair just mentioned, for her 25 years of sterling service as chair of the Nobel Laureate Festival Committee. Welcome, Your Excellency, and thank you for honoring us with your presence this evening, even after such a long day. A pleasant good evening to everyone joining us here this evening. Those physically present, as well as the many persons joining in via the live stream. As head of the Global Campus St. Lucia site, it is my privilege to extend a warm welcome to all of you joining us for the very first lecture of the 2024 National Reparations Lecture Series. The UWI Global Campus St. Lucia site has had a long association with the National Reparations Committee from its inception over a decade ago. As a founding member of the committee, we have had the honor of supporting the work of the committee, in particular, leveraging the technical capacity of the UWI Global Campus to assist with online presentations to the general public, as well as an outreach program to school children across the region, of which the NRC is particularly proud. The UE is no stranger to the fight for reparations. Voices such as those of our Vice Chancellor, Professor Sir Hilary Beckles, Chair of the CARICOM Reparations Committee, and renowned author of Britain's Black Debt, and more recently, 
how Britain underdeveloped the Caribbean, and also Professor Vereen Shepherd, current director of the Center for Reparation Research at the University of the West Indies, have for decades been raised in the call for reparatory justice. Their voices has been raised in the call to account for the forced displacement of over 12 million people from the African continent by European colonial powers and over 350 years of enslavement and unpaid labor by them and their descendants, which made a significant, significant contribution to the rapid development and accumulation of the wealth held today by European nations, private corporations, and individual families. And side by side with them has been our very own Honorable Ambassador Dr. June Sumer, an indefatigable reparations champion who continues to advocate for equality and equity in sustainable development, particularly in the Caribbean region. Her recent ascent to the prestigious position of Chair Designate of the Permanent Forum on People of African Descent speaks volumes regarding the esteem in which she is held globally. An extra special welcome to our campus, Ambassador Suma. We look forward to your presentation this evening and to the lively discussion that will inevitably ensue upon its conclusion. Welcome again to you all. Thank you. And uh, it is my honor to um, present our speaker this evening, um, the first uh, presenter in our year-long series during which we plan to go to every one of the 17 constituencies in St. Lucia on a monthly basis on the last Thursday of every month as we did with our first uh, series of National Reparations Lectures uh, in the year uh, uh, 2020. Um, I was just remarking to Dr. Sumo that this is the shortest bio um, that I've seen of her. Um, and um, it is my pleasure to uh, let those of us who don't fully know who is going to be speaking to us this evening about what. I will first let you know um, who is going to be addressing us and, of course, on what and why it is important that this topic that is being presented this evening to St. Lucia, the Caribbean, and the whole wide world through the World Wide Web is one that will significantly contribute to a better understanding and appreciation uh, by Caribbean people, in this case St. Lucia, of what really is being fought for on their behalf over the past 10 years by governments, none of which have undertaken a national consultation. Um, as we speak, there is a regional consultation that um, has already started, uh, but um, as with our a feature speaker often being described as the June of firsts because of the number of firsts that she has scored. Um, what we are doing this evening is launching the process of taking the reparations issue to the people on whose behalf we are seeking reparations and St. Lucians will have the first opportunity to say to us and to the governments that represent us and the people what their views are. And through these sessions to put questions to our presenters who will come from a wide range of um, subject portfolios associated with reparations. So who do we have this evening? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Honorable Ambassador Dr. June Sumer, SLC, St. Lucia Cross, holds a PhD in history from the University of the West Indies. She lectured at the University of the West Indies and universities in the United States and worked at the 
Eastern Caribbean Central Bank between 1996 and 2006. That's an entire decade. She was St. Lucia's plenipotentiary ambassador to the OECS and CARICOM with responsibility for diaspora affairs from 2008 to 2016, eight years. And following that, she was the Secretary General of the Association of Caribbean States from 2016 to 2020, the first woman to hold uh, that position, one of her many uh, firsts. And of notice that she was the first woman to hold uh, these posts, like I've just mentioned, as well as the post of the Chair of the Global Campus Council, a position that she currently holds and we also have to note that she's also the chair designate of the united nations permanent forum for people of african descent and she was one of the two caribbean representatives on the permanent forum and she has been elected and appointed and is the designate uh, chair of uh, the permanent forum um, which is expected to uh, be confirmed within a matter of a weeks, um, more weeks than months. And of course we have the fact that over the years she has received many awards including the St. Lucia Cross for distinguished service in the fields of education, diplomacy, regionalism, and development specialty. That was in February 2021. And uh, the order of Jose de, Marcelo, Jose de Macolota of the degree of the Grand Cross from the Republic of Nicaragua in the area of diplomacy. And that also was in 2021 and a tireless advocate for the global reparations movement honorable ambassador dr june sumer is a founder member of the saint lucia reparations committee the national reparations committee and a member of the united nations permanent forum for people of african descent and her topic this evening will be the the Brattle Report on Reparations for Transatlantic Chattel Slavery in the Americas and the Caribbean, exploring the case for reparations, justice, and equality for women of African descent. Let's put our hands together to welcome Ambassador Dr. Honorable June Schumer. Thank you very much, Earl. And let me say what an honor it is to represent the National Reparations Committee at this launch. And I invite you to listen carefully because I want questions. It's the first time that the Brattle Report is being presented in St. Lucia, I, I, at least to the public. And so this report gives us the opportunity to see the amounts or, and the valuations that have been placed on our labor and on our lives. And I go into the presentation by trying to find out whether you think that the valuation that has been given is a good one. So I want your assessment because we want governments to discuss this report. It will be a report that, um, that will be presented to them and we want them to be able to come back to us and tell us about it. So, I thought I would start the presentation by saying to you that reparations is not a new theme for us or a new pursuit for us. People are always saying to me, because I am really an ardent activist in this area, why all of a sudden you all are talking about reparations? Why don't we leave this behind? Why are we trying to, to rewrite history? Why are we trying to raise history? It's in our past. Let's forget about it. But I want you to see that it is not in our past 
that it is in our present. And if we do not work on it now, it will be in our future. And so I want to tackle reparations and repair from that perspective. Moreover, I want to focus some attention on women. Why do I want to do that? I will go into a lot of depth as to why I want and I'm advocating for reparations for women. But I'm doing it because I think there has been an undervaluing of women, enslaved women, women in colonialism, and women currently that has caused even for me, within such a prestigious report, um, it has caused a certain amount of angst because we are so undervalued that if we do not speak out as women of African descent, the whole undervaluing of what is owed to us will take place. Because if you undervalue what is owed to women, what is owed to the whole reparations movement is undervalued. And so I want to take that perspective. I start with this quotation from a former enslaved person who had escaped, uh, not escaped, but left because of the civil war in the United States and the planter wanted him to come back to the plantation. And he writes to the planter saying, look, where I am now, I am earning money. So, if after serving you for so many years, 32 years, and his wife for a certain number of years, 20 years, um, if you can offer me what you owe me now, and he gives the amount. So, so we start to see amounts very early in the reparations movement. People talking about giving me back my pension, giving me a pension for the years I served you on the plantation. Give me um, what you owe me for years of free labor and their naming amounts. We start to see a naming of amounts very early, even during enslavement. You start to see people asking for what is owed to them. So this is nothing new for us. What was interesting to me in that little quotation is the fact that he's asking for less. You see the less for what his wife is, is owed? You see the amount he's asking for compared to what he's asking for for himself? And I will go into that in, in more depth as we go along. And so I look at some of the valuations on the transatlantic chattel slavery um, to date, so what people have asked for. I give you an overview on the Brattle Report so you will understand better this report that has been developed for the Caribbean. I look at specifics related to women in that report, and I ask the question, which I try to answer also within the text, is this valuation adequate? And I give you some conclusions. And so for the for, for, um, transatlantic slavery valuations, we see a number of them during enslavement. And I think the first really recorded one, people have asked, asked for them verbally, but people didn't go to court. When people started to go to court, they started to record them. And the first one we have is in 1782, when um, Belinda Royal asked for her 50 years of pension from the plantation owner. We move on to Cali House in 1890, who asked for 68 million, the same amount that was paid to the, um, to the, the soldiers who fought in the Civil War. She asks for that. And then we see Marcus Garvey later on in the 1920s asking for one billion for African Americans. So you start to see a different, you see it from a personal perspective, you see it from, um, from groups, you start to see it from regions. So, so you see African Americans under Marcus Garvey. And there are a number of valuations that have been done that I found between 2004 and um, up to about 2020. And um, most of these valuations focus on the United States. They focus on the United States. But you can see the range. I showed them to you because I wanted to, for you to see the range people are asking for. You know, and at this stage, in, the, in, in this decade and this century, people in the 21st century, people are asking for trillions. 
and it has reached as high as $5.9 trillion in one case. And in the case of the last one in 2020, um, the cost of colonialism, um, Hickel asks for $30 trillion for the entire period, including colonialism. The indigenous people also have a report before the UN that they presented in 2018, which calls for $5 trillion. So we can see that there's a range, but people have been trying to value this. And it's not an easy thing to do, but it certainly is something that we in the Caribbean needed to do. Even in St. Lucia, we had started since the um, 1890s asking for reparation. And we have the quotation from the um, Royal Commission by, by John Quinlan of St. Lucia, who goes before the, um, the commission and says, these peasants are descendants of the slaves that were emancipated 50 years ago. And he, st he was speaking to a commission that had been sent down to look at the economic conditions in the Caribbean. And they came to St. Lucia. And things were so desperate that the commission had to hear or receive um, petitions from the public. And this is what Mr. Quinlan said. He says the British government knows perfectly well that they, referring to the, 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 the previously enslaved people, are entitled to just as much consideration as their masters received 50 years ago. Of the millions due the, these slaves throughout the West Indies, we in St. Lucia are entitled to many hundreds thousands. Make your amends Britisher while your chest is overflowing. I don't know the British will tell you now that their chest is overflowing, but when their chest was overflowing, they didn't give it to us then either. But I'm showing you that we always put forward a case for reparations. It's nothing new. So we come now to the Brattle Report. The Brattle Report was prepared for the University of the West Indies and the American Society of International Law second symposium on reparations under international law. So we, are, we have been talking a lot for the last 13, 10 years, but more than that. Um, but we want to make a legal case. And you must do the research and put in the work. So Brattle, the Brattle Group decided to put in the work to tell us how much is owed to us. I have to tell you that the Brattle Group acknowledged from the beginning that there were some challenges, um, and so they were only able to look at things that were quantifiable. They looked at legal issues for them to be able to see what has been paid in the past, and so they can see what is quantifiable and what is unquantifiable. And it's a comprehensive outlook. It looks at the entire region, including Latin America, the United States, etc. And it gives us, it goes through a process. And in that process, it concludes that the transatlantic chattel slavery was not lawful. Because people have a way of telling me, but slavery was legal at the time. The Brattle Group has concluded, and we're talking about lawyers, economists, a whole group of people, that transatlantic slave trade was unlawful. OK? And that's a very good first step for us. And so if we now say that it was illegal, then restitution must be the next step. Restitution must be the next, next step for us to be able to, to um, mitigate, get rid of, et cetera, the, um, the challenges that we face now. And if not mitigation, then reparations or compensation, which is what they had paid to the, the um, former slave owners. And so that report determined that compensation had to be paid by the former slave um, holding states for the wrongful act of the transatlantic chattel slavery. That's the overview. And the Brattle quantification is historic because for the first time, you have an available scientific and well-argued quantification of reparations due for the, the um, transatlantic slave trade and for chattel slavery. In, as I said, it was comprehensive in the Caribbean, Central America, South America, and North America. I told you before that 
um, Brattle indicated that the report was divided into two parts because there were some things that were quantifiable and there were some things that they could not quantify. And these things that were quantifiable included loss of life and uncompensated labor, loss of liberty, personal injury, mental pain and anguish, and gender-based violence. So we can get reparations for these things. But because they cannot quantify the other things, then there's a challenge. It means from the onset that you don't have a full picture of a, a, a valuation then because there are, so, there are some limits. So things like intergenerational trauma that we speak about all the time, they say it's unquantifiable. Loss of identity. I mean, I can quantify that for them if they want. Loss of identity. Loss of family. How can you not quantify loss of family and things like that? You know? When you go to a, 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 a psychiatrist because you have been traumatized, isn't there some way of quantifying it? I figure there is. So they are saying because of that, they have been able to come up with two sums that need to be paid by all former slaveholding states. And so for the period of enslavement, you have 107 trillion US dollars. And for the post-enslavement period, 22 trillion US dollars. I am not too sure that's enough for, and it's one of the things I question, for systemic racism that continues to oppress people of African descent, 22 trillion. I know some people are saying, wow, June, but that's a lot of money. You know, how are they going to pay us if it's so much money? Let us um, not worry about that yet. It is not our debt to pay. So let us talk about what is owed. I'm trying to to not preempt you with, quest with your questions, but try to, to bring some clarity as we go along. And, so, and the other limitation of the um, Brattle Report, and I have to say that they tell you these things up front. They don't hide anything. It's a very comprehensive report. The report does not address the earnings of plantation owners, so what they have earned from the plantation. They, it does not um, it does not address banks. A lot of banks supported, we know banks like Barclays, for example, supported the slave trade. Insurance companies like Lloyds of London, you know, and other entities that profited from the transatlantic chattel slavery. And they tell you this is a work in progress. They're still gathering the data. So the, the 107 trillion and the 22 trillion might increase because we might look at these other people differently. Now, with the overview, you, I, I, because it's such a big report, I try to just focus on the CARICOM countries. So I pull that out of the report. And so the estimated reparations amounts for CARICOM countries for enslavement, you can see these amounts here uh, in billions of US dollars, and as well as the, the countries that have to pay. So for example, in the case of Antigua and Barbuda, you have a certain amount that Britain has to pay. You have some for Belize. I couldn't understand the Belize one. So, so I'm not sure that I can answer a question on it. The Virgin Islands, the islands that are, 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 are called the British Virgin Islands, but don't call them that because that's not their legal name. I was just in the Virgin Islands, and they, they, they insist that you call them their legal name, which is the Virgin Islands and not the BVI. So please, don't call them the BVI. Um, Dominica, Grenada gets from Britain and France. Haiti gets from France, and you see the amounts in billions of US dollars. And then we come down to St. Lucia. I have to tell you that when I saw what they put in for St. Lucia, I behaved like a St. Lucian. I said, eh, eh, what happened to the French? For my entire life, I learned seven times British and seven times French. We even make it romantic by singing about it in songs. So where are the French in our reparations claims? And I have told Earl on more than one occasion, I am not letting the French get away. So we have to do the work now ourselves to make sure that we put in the amount that the French owes to us. And you can see for all of the countries the amounts that are owed for enslavement. And then 
we go to the amounts that are owed to the CARICOM countries in the post-enslavement period. You can see it again in billions of dollars. Barbados is 51 billion. Um, the Virgin Islands is 3 billion. Mind you, they're still trying to take back the Virgin Islands. Um, and right now, there's a whole... C and, and that's one of the things that we have to recognize when we are doing reparations. I find it hard to talk about reparations when there are still countries that are colonized in the Caribbean. And we're talking about post-enslavement sums. We cannot do reparations without doing decolonization. And that is also one of my, my pet peeves, that there are still colonies in the Caribbean. And so you can see what is owed. I don't know why uh, under Grenada, France owes zero in the post-enslavement period. Just because you are no longer an occupier does not um, in any way say that you are not responsible for what has happened to the people in the post-colonial period. So you removed yourself because Britain um, won a war, a European war in the Caribbean. And uh, you, say to your, you say to the people of Grenada, oh, well, the French left after the English took over, so they are no longer responsible for giving you reparations in the post-enslavement um, period. I do not agree. And we can argue that as we go along. And the same thing for, for the other countries. St. Lucia is getting from Britain. Again, where is France? Seven times British, seven times French. Up to today, I heard somebody saying, well, we were fought over 14 times. I don't think it's a romantic thing. You know, and, I've, and I have mentioned that in other circles before. So these are the figures that, we sh we, we, um, that have been calculated, the devaluations that have been done, trillions of dollars owed to the Caribbean um, for transatlantic chattel slavery and for post-slavery colonialism. There's a critique right at the beginning of the Brattle Report by Judge Robinson, who sits on the ICJ. He's from Jamaica. He sits on the ICJ, and he was able to, to write a synopsis. And it's in the front of the report where he, he gives a critique of that report. And he said, there is an underestimation in the amount of reparations owed. And that's also my view, as follows. It's a very conservative working method. And, and, and the challenge for, for the Brattle Group is that the numbers are not always there for you to make the estimation. But we know how many people came out of Africa. We know by now on the, of the underdevelopment of Africa because of the removal of key able-bodied women and men. Because they didn't go to Africa to take old people. They took people who were in their productive years and reproductive years to be able to bring to the Caribbean to work. So, there is an assumption that one person was born, that one person was born into slavery. You take for every person that you brought, one person was, brought, was born into slavery. I don't know that is true. Because as we start to look at the, the issue of women, you will see that young women 10 to 13 were being raped on the plantation and having children so if you have your first child when you're 10 don't tell me that it's only one we're talking about because by the time you reach 40 the number of times you would have had children okay maybe early in in, in enslavement there was not an emphasis on reproduction but once the slave trade ended in 1807 we had to reproduce the slaves or the enslaved. He also says there's very, it's very conservative. Um, it was very conservative in fixing the interest rate. The interest rate, because uh, quite apart from the amount they calculated, they also put in an interest rate. And the interest rate is at 2.5%. He's saying that is very conservative because already they were saying 3% was very low. And they went as low as 2.5%. So he's asking 
you know, for us to, to review that because it underestimates the total reparations due. And he also says that the, the harm inflicted on the enslaved are not fully captured by the five quantifying areas. Remember I showed you before loss of life and all of these issues, um, gender-based violence and so, he's saying that these five issues do not capture all the harm that was done to the um, enslaved people. He's also saying that they use something called wealth disparity to look at the, um, the, so they look at, for example, what is the wealth of Britain as opposed to the wealth of St. Lucia. They look at what is the wealth of white people as opposed to the wealth of black people in the United States. And he's saying that what the method they use is also very conservative. Because it is not just, for me, the wealth is not just about the amount of money you have in the bank. But what you are able to do, I'm not an economist, but how your one dollar multiplies is very important. So, so there's a, a, an underestimation there. He also says that um, in the post-slavery period, the, um, the harms caused are also underestimated. And he, but he, he concludes, however, that nevertheless, um, this report is a good a good document or a good negotiating tool for governments because never before have they had that kind of scientific work done. So governments now have to take the next step to negotiate with the offending country with regard to reparations and whether or not reparations will be paid. But he warns us also that um, what it, what it does is to just tell the victim states that reparation, the reparations to which they are entitled under, in, under international law. But it is, and it's a good instrument for that, but um, the descendants of, because the descendants of the enslaved were just groping in the dark before, we always talked about reparations without knowing how much, you know, et cetera, and for what we wanted the reparations. But this gives us a good, um, basis. Now, while I was reading the, the report, I had to put in some preliminary conclusions because I didn't want to wait till the end for me to tell you I conclude ABCD. And I'm saying that part of the challenge for this report is there is not enough comprehensive research on the histories of these countries. So we see a lot of research, for example, on Jamaica, a lot of research on Barbados, a lot of research on these sugar, bigger sugar plantations. But there is not enough research, for example, on St. Lucia. You know the instability that happened in this country with the centuries of, of, of European wars over St. Lucia? The impact that it had on enslaved people? How are we going to not quantify these things? Simply because we have not taken the time to do the research. And there is research. There's a certain amount of research on St. Lucia, but not enough for us to be able to be in the realm of countries like Barbados and Jamaica, etc. So we have work to do. And, and, and I was hoping that at least one government official would be there for me to tell them, we have work to do, you know. Um, and for me, another issue has to do with European collaboration. So we are, we are identifying individual countries to give reparations. So let's say, let's say for Haiti, we are seeing um, France. But what happened to the collaborators? What happened with those colonial governments that got together to destroy Haiti? Why are we only asking France? It was the first time you saw Europeans come together in a European Union against Haiti. France, Spain, Britain, and later on the United States to destroy Haiti and to put down what was supposed to be the first black republic in the region and in the world. What happened to collaborators? What happened to collaborators like the Dutch who were at the heart of the slave trade 
and therefore had a footprint in every single one of our countries. What happened to them? Why are we not asking people in St. Lucia not asking for reparations from the Dutch? Because the British were the last colonizers. What happened to collaborators? So that's one of my conclusions. We have to look at these collaborators. Um, no legal term, we still designate these countries overseas territories, that's not a legal term, and, and, and so that goes back to my point on colonialism and the proper language for these things. Um, and he also says, um, finally, that each destination must prepare a substantive negotiating brief to supplement the gaps, and there are gaps in the report, and they acknowledge, as I said, the gaps, and so we have to work. The National Reparations Committee has to try and fill in some of these gaps that the Brattle Report um, has. Now, since, since the emphasis was on quantifiable, the emphasis on enslaved women in the Brattle Report is primarily addressed under the section entitled Gender-Based Violence. It starts with the acknowledgment that sexual assault and forced pregnancy was widely experienced by enslaved women and documented by the slavers. There are, there are journals, there are um, diaries from the planters on the number of rapes that they committed. It's there for us to see. The report estimated that the number of women who were sexually abused during enslavement, you see that? 1,208,925. I'm still saying that's an underestimation. It estimated from available databases that 35% of those enslaved were women. I am still saying that's an underestimation because after, and I will show you some, some, some figures as we go along, that um, for, and they said for the sake of consistency, this 35% was applied with regard to the Middle Passage as well as those who were born into slavery. And they, but they acknowledged that that number may be low. And it used age 10 as a conservative estimate of the age of the first non-consensual sexual encounter. So it could have happened before. All right? So... One of the things I have not pointed out, and you may have noticed at the bottom of my, or each of my slides, or almost all of my slides, I have the name of a woman who worked on a plantation somewhere in the Caribbean. Most of them are, are, are from St. Lucia. But I put the names always when I do reparations lectures, because you must never be afraid to say the names. These are the people that I am speaking about as I go along. These are the names of these women who were raped sometimes for 40-something years. Okay, so, so, so also pay attention to the names at the bottom of the slides as we go along. And the, the report says that given the prevalence of sexual abuse and the near constant threat enslaved women faced in having their sexual autonomy revoked or abuse, we believe that it is reasonable to assume 100% of enslaved women over the age of 10 face sexual abuse. Every single enslaved woman. And, he's, and so there is a figure that really caught my attention in the report. 51 million 339,836 years of gender-based violence experienced by disembarked enslaved women. If you take that number and you divide it by life expectancy, you will see that these women were raped for almost 40 years from age 10. 51 million rapes in the Caribbean. So you think, I'm, uh, you think that I am groping when I ask for reparations for women of African descent? No. 
These are the numbers that, I have, that you, you are dealing with. And so he's, the, the report says that the, for lifetime gender-based violence damages for enslaved women brought to the Americas, you have billions, you have it in billions. I myself think that it's trillions. Not if you tell me. Because you're undervaluing. If you're telling me that there are 53 million rapes in the, in, the, in the period of the 400 years of enslavement, it means you're undervaluing if you give me these numbers for gender-based violence. But they are going with regard to the, what is obtained now in courts with regard to gender-based violence. I still think that gender-based violence in the Caribbean is underestimated and undervalued. Women ought to be paid more for this kind of abuse. So I'm making non-historical statements there, but I am telling you that it is based on what I have seen in the, in the report and in history. So is the valuation adequate? Has this report gone far enough? If it has not taken the time to note that chattel was not a gender neutral term. Remember I told you that this is for chattel slavery. Chattel is not a gender neutral term. We're talking about both men and women. And that if men were, de if men were denied their humanity, black women were considered even less. And we are still considered even less. Firstly, whether we, uh, we are underestimating the cost of the payment due because we are undervaluing the contributions of women. So under the, 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 those that they assessed, are we also undervaluing because we are undervaluing the contributions of women? So if, my, if you have a, a, a man on the plantation, I was about to say my husband, though that's out. If you have a man on the plantation and you are in the post-slavery period and you're paying him five shillings, you would pay the woman for the same amount of work, two shillings. Okay? So you have a wage disparity, even if she might be doing more than him. You know? There's also a challenge because of the numbers issue, and, and I'll get to that. I think, are we restricted by colonial myths about the nature and character of women of African descent? And is our misunderstanding limiting the expansion of our democracy and the equality of women in the Caribbean? So we don't work as hard. So you underestimate us. You don't pay us what we are owed. So you, and you entrench the inequality that started during enslavement. You know? When you know those of you who had mothers who worked in the house, your, mothers would, your mother would go out to work, work in the, in, the, in the garden, come back and cook the food, wash the clothes, etc., etc. What are we estimating if we do not take all these things into consideration? Does the quantification of loss of life and uncompensated labor fully explore the labor and the labor of enslaved women? and its impact on continued systemic racism on the offspring of women of African descent. I think by undervaluing women of African descent and women, enslaved women, you are also undervaluing their children. And that accounts for the continued racism. Because I have said in other places, it is only an enslaved woman who could reproduce an enslaved person? Think about it. If an enslaved man had a child with a white woman, and that happened very often, um, was not born a slave. If a white man had a child with a white woman, child was not born a slave. If a white man had a child, with a black woman, born a slave. If a black man had a child with a black woman, born a slave. So are we undervalued, by undervaluing women, are we also undervaluing their children? Serious question. As I said, the grouping called enslaved was not a generic grouping. 
let us differentiate enslaved women whose experience was specific to them and not just insert them into a conversation as if they were bystanders, bystanders and not participants. We were not, particip we were not just standing by. And, 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 and I argue that in other places, that I do not want us to just look at things through a gender lens. I want us to look at, in more detail, the experiences of, of enslaved women. Don't just say, let us do this through a gender lens. Because it might be just to appease me, because I say it must be done. No, let us be serious about things and look at these things and look at the experiences of, of enslaved women. Is the valuation adequate? Lack of recognition of a, a, of a devaluing of our work? Let us start with the numbers. Is it only about numbers? So just because you have 10 men and you have one woman, why are you undervaluing her work just because of numbers? Is, is she doing less than the man when she's working? I think that, you know, it reminds me all the time when I was growing up and I did mathematics. If it takes 10 men to dig a hole in four days, how long will it take to dig the hole? I would say to myself, just bring in two women. And the work would get done. You wouldn't pay, pay them all that money. So I'm saying that numbers are not the only thing, but the quality of the work that you did and the value of the work that you did. And um, I'm saying also that there is a misconception, because by emancipation, and the British themselves wrote it, that, that um, and other people wrote it, for example, Rhoda Redock wrote it, that um, women worked more in the fields and were equal on the things like the whip. So why weren't we equal with when pay came along? We were equal when they were beating us, you know. And we also see that in places like St. Vincent, that in the post-emancipation period, that women made up the majority of the field laborers. And, 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 and Beckles also explores that in Barbados, that Barbados is the only slave society that reproduced itself because women were having children. So that means there were more women, more and more women. So why are we underestimating the numbers of women? And in St. Lucia, for example, because I always look for the St. Lucian bits um, as I do these things, um, um, Father Jess wrote that um, during, the, during the wars between, one of the, the last wars between the British and the French, Yes, there were 400 men fit to bear arms, but there were maybe four times that number of women. So we were also on the front line, not only in the plantations, we were also fighting. We were in the maroon societies. You know, we were the ones who, who kept these maroon societies alive. We cooked the food, we planned the food, because the men would go out to fight. We looked after the children, etc., in the maroon societies. And we maintained these settlements. Um, and also, when it came down to emancipation, and they, they started to divide us into predial and non-predial workers, workers who worked in the field and not, women more, were more likely to be um, brought into the group where they would have to work two more years on the plantations. So all of these things we have to consider when we are doing the, the, the valuation. We also worked not only in the fields, but also in the houses, in the nurseries, in the hospitals. There's a lady on one of these, um, and her surname is L'Hopital, because she was a nurse in the hospital. And they sometimes would call them by, the, by their profession. They, their surname would be their profession. So whatever her name is, L'Hopital, was a nurse. So we know that there were a variety of jobs, even if they kept us from the most jobs considered more skilled. And to a large extent, this undervaluing, I believe, is because of patriarchy. Black women were not seen, have only been seen as physical beings, not thinking beings. That assignment was left for white women. And so you can understand why, when you look at the corporate ladders, white women are going up and black women are staying at a certain level. Because we are not the thinking people because of our race and our gender. And patriarchy, to a large extent, has assisted in the devaluation of women. And patriarchy was learned from white men. 
black men behave the way they behave because patriarchy was learned from the um, colonialists. And we have to recognize that. Is the valuation adequate? I'm asking why again? Why am I asking that? Because of the lack of specificity of women. Women in the text are usually examined alongside men or alongside white women. Women of African descent don't have their own identity within the text. And that is part of the devaluation. And so there are a number, and I have to give credit to a number of intellectuals who are going below that veil to look at women and what they're doing on what they experience during enslavement, but it's still not enough. We have more to do. I'm asking why again? Because of the continued discounting of childbearing during enslavement. Say, oh, it wasn't important to bear a child because they could replenish from Africa. But after 1807, it was important. It was important to the point where they used some of these people that were born into enslavement to, to um, colonize other countries, to set up plantations in other countries like um, the late um, colonies like Trinidad and Tobago, Guyana, and so on. So it was important. There's also the myth that women of African descent have a higher pain threshold. It has been written that because we have masculinized bodies that we can withstand pain. And so they did a lot of experiments. That data has to be there for you to understand what has been done to women with regard to their health. It has to be there. So we have to find it for us to be able to see how the, the slave owners collaborated with medical persons. And it's written. It's actually written in medical books to the point where even today, when black women go into have babies, they don't want to give them anesthetics because you can bear the pain. Why are you bawling? You know, these are things that we have to get rid of. Um, so I'm saying surely this evidence is there and that we need to be able to look at it apart, apart from being just loss of labor. So it's dealt with in the text as loss of labor. So you are having a baby, so that's loss of labor. No, there are other things attached to, to it. And I'm telling you this because even up to, to, to 2023, the report of, published by the UN on maternal health of women and girls and African descent, of African descent in the Americas, it says, Afro-descendant women and girls in the Americas are disadvantaged before, during, and after pregnancy. Afro-descendant maternal deaths in particular are alarmingly high in both absolute terms and, one com and ones compared to other groups, non-African descendant groups. Structural racism and sexism are evident in maternal health disparities that exist across income levels and national and regional borders. Racism and discrimination by medical pro providers increase the likelihood that women and girls of African descent will experience mistreatment in maternity care. So we're not simply talking about what happened in the past. We are talking about how the past has affected our present. And that is important when you look at reparations. Moreover, I think that the enslavement destroyed the image of African people of African descent, especially women, and has entrenched patriarchal constructions of a woman's body that perpetuate ridicule of the black female body and defines what is beautiful. You know that. You know you were growing up and you will hear um, things like, you are very pretty because of the color of your skin. I can tell you all of them. You have good hair. I prefer a shabin. You know? All of the colorism things that we, we, we take for granted, we don't realize where we have learned them and how they continue to affect us. So, black women are not supposed to be beautiful. You know? And I think that has perpetuated the gender-based violence against women. 
because there is this, and the rape of black women, because we are supposed to be hypersexualized, and so it is, you know, it's not anything to, 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 to treat us and abuse us in that manner. And that has resulted in a lot of self-hate. And so you see a lot of the things that people criticize now, whether women have weaves or how much makeup they wear, etc. black women, that is only because black women are managing a marginalized identity. You have always been told that the person with the long hair was the pretty one. You understand why they're bleaching? Because it is the fair-skinned women who attract men, not the dark-skinned women. So you have to manage this identity that has been marginalized over centuries because people have always told you that black women are not, this, um, are not desirable. Very important. So is the valuation adequate? The battle report ensures that it listed its limitations from the beginning and that there are some things that are not quantifiable. I accept that. Some figures within the report are quantifiable, but I think are too conservative. I think that there are gaps in the research and the research needs to continue. And you know why I think that research has to continue? I think it's because there's a systematic approach of dehumanizing African women, which started in the 17th century and which set the tone for the continued devaluation of women of African descent to this day. I wrote that in an article that I presented. Earl had asked me to present uh, something, and I entitled it Stiff Back Spines, the Militancy Defiance and Plain Speaking of Enslaved Women in St. Lucia in 2007. And that devaluation continues today. I hope that after this lecture, you become more aware of these things as you go through um, your daily life in St. Lucia. I also think that by locating women of African descent in the reparations dialogue, we give them back their humanity. By talking about the, five, the 50 million rapes, I think that you have that feeling that we're talking about human beings that spent 40 years under an abusive situation. We have to give them back their humanity. And if we give them back their humanity, we give back humanity to all people of African descent because it is our undervaluing of black women that has caused the undervaluing of the black race. We need to focus attention on the unquantifiable. The report has many unquantifiable things. I think that we need to focus our attention on making sure that we can quantify those things that are unquantifiable for us to um, understand the impact. And finally, I want to say to you that reparations concerns both our past and our present. And that comes from the report of the Special Rapporteur on Contemporary Forms of Racism, Racial Discrimination, Xenophobia, and Racial Intolerance. Um, there are many um, wrongful acts that have been con um, committed against individuals. Reparations for slavery and colonialism implicates entire legal, economic, social, and political structures that enable that enabled slavery and colonialism and which continue to sustain racial discrimination and inequality even today. I thank you. Thank you, Honorable Ambassador Dr. Sumo, um, for this comprehensive brief analysis of the Brattle Report, uh, its history, its historicity, and putting into context the undervaluation, underappreciation, and therefore the insufficiency of the assessment of women, the assess 
under assessment of all aspects that would lead to an ultimate amount uh, that uh, we would be looking for. As she pointed out, uh, the report um, starts with an admission that it is insufficient, but quite apart from that, um, it looks at a, an amount during slavery and an amount post-slavery. But as Dr. Sumo has pointed out, we also have to uh, look at the call for reparations from the standpoint uh, that reparations um, cannot be complete without decolonization. So it is a, a very comprehensive assessment and um, Dr. Sumo has uh, thrown out uh, some important uh, challenges um, to us and uh, to the authors of the uh, Brattle report that notwithstanding their admission of insufficiency, there is still much work to be done, research to be continued, and therefore uh, this is what we are looking for by way of the launch as of this evening of the first in our series of consultations on reparations. Uh, we are monitoring the chat online and um, we are also prepared to take your questions in-house. Um, it doesn't, of course, only have to be questions. You can share your observations and um, make the contributions that we look forward to, whatever they may be, because every contribution adds to um, the discussion and every discussion adds to the debate. So the floor is open, the lines are open, and um, let's get going. Let's, um, first of all, let's start with uh, uh, Monsignor Dr. Patrick Anthony. Thanks, um, Ambassador. A uh, few things. Who initiated this battle report? What's the origin of it? And um, secondly, what international institution would that report have to be taken to to give its because it's a legal document what institution would give it um, legitimacy or it can be taken to a resort say look this we are looking for restitution so what institution would be would would guarantee that thank you Trevor. Um, with regard to the first question, it was a series, two symposiums, I think, that were held um, in the, called the, the Symposium on Reparations under International Law, organized by the University of the West Indies. Yes, UE and the, uh, Associate, the American Society of International Law. So, um, in going through the symposia, they prepared this report for consideration. This report has been presented at the CARICOM Reparations Commission meeting, uh, not in its entirety. Judge Robinson did come forward and present the, the, um, the synopsis at the front of the report to us. Um, this report, um, we can recommend from the CRC that it goes to the governments for consideration because really and truly, as I said in the presentation, Judge Robinson recommends it as a negotiating brief for the governments. So, so in the end, governments have to know about it and to do that. I myself think that the Brattle Report ought to be discussed as a public document. Um, Reparations is not simply about what we are doing. We are not the only movement. The governments have agreed that this is the CARICOM reparations movement, but it's not a government thing. It belongs to the people. And so I think that we ought to discuss it, and I'm hoping that Earl will take it to the communities as, he, as we do our reparations consultations. 
so that people will understand what we are talking about. Look at the context of the report as I try to pre present with regard to just women, but we can do it in, re in relation to enslavement on a whole. And also, we need to talk about um, reparations in a much deeper sense. Reparations with regard to what would happen um, with, if we receive funds. You know, some countries, I was looking at the reparations um, report from California, and individuals are actually, because California was not a slave owning state, and uh, but maybe about 4,000 enslaved people were taken to California, and so you can trace their descendants. And so they are giving individual checks. And there are other communities and, and counties in the United States that have started doing that, giving individual. But we have to decide the form, because all of us are descendants. How will we, what is the form that reparations will take? One of the questions I also get with regard to that is um, about governments and what they're going to do with the money. Everybody's always afraid that governments will take the money. We haven't reached that stage yet with regard to the forms, etc. But I think that alongside the money discussion, we must talk about these unquantifiable things that the Brattle Report pointed to, the trauma. How do we do the self-repair? What do we put in place? You know, I think that we have to do the two things together. Otherwise, I will continue to get the question, why are we blaming the, black, the white man? I get that question all the time for our situation. You can blame the white man and you can point at him because he's responsible. It's like a rapist. You have to name your rapist. You have to point your finger at them. And you have to say, this is what you did, while at the same time you pursue um, other psychological, you know, and other assistance that will make you a full person again. But you, you can do the two things simultaneously. Just a follow up. I don't know what I but So we are looking at CARICOM. CARICOM sort of confronting, say, the European Union. Um, but would it be involved with like the International Court of Justice, something like that? Because it's a legal document we have, right? So the battle has been at, at, at what level? That's what I'm looking at. I have, um, since I'm not a legal person, I can only tell you my feeling. I have two, I have two feelings. I'm try still trying to weigh them. Because as a member of the Permanent Forum for People of African Descent, the um, consultations we have had with people on the ground. Um, people have asked for us to take it to the ICJ. But you have to develop the case. I don't think that we are at the point where we can take anything to the ICJ yet. But I think at some point we have to get some legal body to say, yes, you need to pay reparations. Still no guarantee that people will pay reparations, you know? But I think you need to take it into the legal sphere. And I have to tell you that a lot is being done in that regard. Last year, I attended a, a study tour from a group of jurists from Africa that came down to the Caribbean. And we met in Barbados to talk about reparations and what we were looking for. So we are looking to build a case. This year, the jurists are meeting in uh, Africa and they bring in Caribbean jurists to that meeting for them to discuss. So the steps are being taken to build a case before we can go to the ICJ. Now, so I'm, I'm happy about that. I'm conflicted because the ICJ is still a colonial court. That's my conflict. It was set up at the end of the, um, the Second World War. It wasn't set up to serve us. In fact, the only people that have gone before the ICJ are black people, people of African descent, so all the horrors that you see, you know, it's only African leaders and or military people who have been taken to the ICJ. 
it's like been a whip on our back. So I'm conflicted. I'm conflicted sometimes. So then we have to ask ourselves then, if we take it to the ICJ, and the ICJ say no, maybe because of the duration, you are not entitled to um, reparations. What is our next step? So we have to plan all of these things. So I don't think we're ready to go to an international court yet. But we are making our case, Papa. We are moving and we are moving and things are happening. One of the, the greatest things that happened last year, I attended the, the first African um, reparations conference in Ghana. So Africa has always been very silent because it's always thrown at Africa that you were complicit. So Africa has always been cut. But they have done the research and they understand why Africa was forced into selling its people. The case is there. So Africa now is asking for reparations. I think that is a good thing. We are making progress. You have a question? I saw your hand go up. Yes, Pastor Mike. Good evening, Dr. S um, Ambassador Suma and colleague Earl Mosini and members here. I want to make kind of a statement and then come to about three questions. One, I have been following the Reparations Committee for quite a number of years. I've sat on a few committees with you and Earl. And I, I was confronted by a group that I challenged as to why they don't believe that it's necessary to pursue reparations. So listen well. I would sit at university campuses. I would speak to, and I'm speaking about Caribbean students that I've spoken to Caribbean people. Solutions here. When I get into discourse and discussions about um, reparations, religious groups. And one commonality that came out from amongst them was that, why don't we leave this thing alone? I'm sure you've heard this before. It's done. It's over. It's past. And they were, because of my deep spiritual con convictions, I was more or less challenged by the religious groups to say that, where is your spirit of forgiveness? And this is gone. The people that are there now, they are not responsible. It was done by their forefathers. You are not responsible for who you are today, but you, sh you can live with. And I'm, I, can, I can roll the, the comments from my head because they, they burn inside of me. That you are, you are who you are now, so get used to it, get comfortable with it. You are you people who are so much in this um, reparation thing. You are, actually this came from some British Caribbean people. You are actually promoting anger, division, you're promoting racism, rage between the races because those white people today are not responsible for what happened. So are you going to tell me, the argument was even made, would you say to me that if my father burnt your house, must I pay you? I say, of course. If you have the money, in fact, I want your house. But they considered me to be too militant because all my life, I have always been against what I considered the bastardization of my education because what I was taught, the history that I was taught at primary school growing up and what I subsequently learned when I became exposed and especially hanging out with Ghanaians and understanding the history that was written by the white man to be taught to me in a Caribbean school and what I knew made me so interested in reparations and followed it because I knew it was wrong. And I find it so interesting and want to learn more and more. And I do not believe that you're, we are, or you are, 
promoting division, I do not believe that they should not pay because I understand clearly. And I say probably because I'm involved with you all, probably because I'm always around you all. I listen, I discuss, I ask questions. What is wrong then? Is it that your outreach and your education is limited, that it's not involved enough? Because even like looking at here, they're not here. You know, I see a lot of young people, they don't want to hear about reparations. They can't be bothered. If the money comes, yes, they'll take it and they only think of money. Whereas I have seen in that last, this, you remember that big thing we had, where it was broken down that it was not just all about money. They're not interested in learning. Are our young people being targeted to understand? Are we reaching out to them? Because I am really tired of watching young people and even old people looking at me and tell me, leave that alone. I am tired of going around and meeting diaspora people who think that we want to interfere with the white people at the day now that has done nothing to us and we who are trying to make peace with us with black people and we are interfering with them and we're forgetting is the black man is a white man that asks for um especially the British they like to say that that are asked that ask for um, emancipation you know so honestly I have found myself very upset angry challenged especially with the religious sect who think that reparations is really an evil. So how are you guys challenging that? How is your outreach to our young people? How is it that our people cannot become so involved, so interested, so captivated to come and lend their voices and understand what you're doing? That's my question. Thank you. Thank you. The fight for reparations is not for the weary. It's not for the weary because it will take a long time to undo the education, the, what did you call it? The bastardized education system that you, you know, went through. It will take a long time to do it. But I can tell you that all hope is not lost because young people are coming on board with regard to reparations. Maybe they're not here tonight because all of them are online. All of them wanted the link. So we had to, Leslie had to send them the link. So maybe they are listening online. But even if they are not, the National Reparations Committee, and Earl can speak to that better than me, has undertaken education programs with young people. And the National Youth Council actually sits on the reparations committee. So we are engaging with young people. It is not an easy thing to engage with young people now on any subject, far less reparations. It's a very difficult thing. And so we have to find the communication means to do it. And I have to say that the reparations, the National Reparations Committee does its work and has done its work for the last 10 years because of our commitment. We don't get any funding to do it. We do it because of our commitment to the movement and we understand why we must do it. You came after I addressed the question about why are we blaming the white people? I, I, I dealt with that. But I have to tell you that we need to put the blame where it's supposed to be. Yes, we think that, hmm, you know the counter to what you said about blaming the white man? They say, but we're independent. And look what we have done. Well, we just celebrated 45 years of independence in Lucia. What have we done for the people? You understand what happened at independence? Independence did not mean, because I never speak to the issue of post-colonialism. There's no such thing. Colonialism exists today in the Caribbean. There's nothing called post-colonialism. So in our post-independence period, we have had to put in place 
for the last 45 years using our own resources to develop our people. Either by taking loans at exorbitant interest rates because black people pay more interest at the IMF than white people. Or we have had to look for partnerships with governments that are willing to assist us. Because you know when we became independent, when St. Lucia became independent, we had one school for girls, one school for boys. We had one hospital that was underfunded. We have had to develop our own infrastructure. I want all of us in every country to develop an inventory with regard to what the former colonial power has done for you and what you have done for yourselves. And tell me that you have done nothing for, for, for the development of this country over the last 45 years. When independence, when we went to seek our independence, the first country that went was Jamaica. And the colonial secretary wrote to the colonial government and said, give them, they want independence, don't give them any resources. Our independence was not supposed to succeed. They were giving us nothing, absolutely nothing after they had left us in such a depressed state after the 1930s riots. We were too rebellious. How dare us ask for independence? They were going to give us nothing. People don't understand the way in which the compensation money that the, that the planters received, how it has built generational wealth that has put white people in the place that they are today. We have not been able to build generational wealth in fact, we have intergenerational poverty in the Caribbean. What, I don't know how better to explain it to them. I used the, 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 the analogy of the rapist earlier, that you must confront your rapist. They came, extraction that took place during enslavement and colonialism is a form of rape. They raped the country. They took away all the resources. They raped the women. The 50-something million years of rape, F women that were raped for, five day, for 500 years, etc. How are you going to explain it if people are not interested in hearing it? I leave that to Earl, because Earl is going to go down in the communities and in his best Creole, He's going to try to explain reparations. He's bringing Pablo with him to explain what reparations is about. With regard to the church, it is not all the churches. It is not every church. Why Pablo just give a lecture down there in the seminary in Trinidad <laughs> about the responsibility the church must take for the development and what is happening and how the church has to be part of community. The church has to be part of the reparations movement. The church must become a part of the reparations movement. So, I can let him answer that, but I am telling you that it is very important for us to, you know, do these things and have the conversations and not be tired. I am not tired. I am not tired. This is not for the weary. Thanks. We have a question from line. All right. Yes, folks, we'll share some um, online comments. Um, we have a, a comment uh, from Bongo Wisely, a member of the National Reparations Commission. He's also the chair of the Caribbean Rastafari Organization. And um, in his first comment, he says, we need to reactivate the maroon com community in Ayanola, St. Lucia, so we can exercise our sovereignty as African descendants. And in his second post, he says, uh, and I quote, what about internal reparations? The self-healing aspects 
we are still traumatized from the effects of colonization. Um, another comment in our chat is uh, from, we've received congratulations from the Bonnet Human Rights Organization. And of course, when um, I saw we got that message from Bonnet, I remembered um, Ambassador Suma always uh, repeating that there is no pride in us boasting about for being 14, time, 14 wars and being sometimes French and sometimes British. Um, these sort of poetic and thematic um, niceties and flowery descriptions um, tend to catch us. In the case of the Dutch colonies, um, you have in the Caribbean, the ABC Islands, Aruba, Bonaire, and Kirosu. And you have the triple S's, Seba, St. Eustatius, and um, St. Martin. Um, but nonetheless, there are six colonies, six Dutch colonies, in as much as the so-called overseas French departments, Martinique, Guadeloupe, Cayenne, St. Part of St. Martin, etc. They are simply colonies under new names and 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 polished uh, names. Um, also, in response to um, the issue of us making the legal case, I agree that the um, battle report helps us set the stage for the. A legal case. I also agree that we are not yet at the stage where we could make that legal case at the um, International um, Court of Justice or the World Court, but I would also say that part of the historicity of tonight is uh, that the first indication of the possibility of CARICOM taking Europe to court over reparations it came a couple months ago uh, when Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Dr. Ralph Gonzalez, led a CELAC delegation, um, CELAC being the community of Latin American and Caribbean um, nations, and he being the first Eastern Caribbean CARICOM leader of CELAC, temporary, in the position of temporary president, was able to achieve something that CARICOM had not achieved in 10 years, which was an audience with the um, European uh, Commission in uh, Brussels. And that was a summit between Brussels and CARICOM, Caribbean and Latin American countries. And it was during the press conference at that summit that um, Prime Minister Gonzalez indicated that CARICOM has in fact um, been assessing the need to speed up with the preparations uh, for uh, putting the case before um, the International Court of Justice or the International Criminal Court. Of course, um, as Dr. Sumer has pointed out, not only are we not yet ready because St. Lucia um, and Grenada and those other countries uh, that um, we suffered under French colonialism and slavery um, have, you know, have, have not yet been assessed insofar as the quantification of the French, the French debt. Um, the Dutch, we've only just heard about the Dutch apology. So all of that is happening and um, while we continue to discuss the uh, action continues. Insofar as um, Dr. Fletcher's, Ambassador Fletcher's um, question about the different reactions from elderly and younger persons as well as similar reactions where they may be seen, um, you know, let's, let's forget it, it's, it's all history. Um, the experience of the National Reparations Committee, and we always repeat that, was that when we launched our lecture series um, after our inception in 2013, we had two responses when we went to the communities. Two distinct responses from youth 
and elderly persons. The youth, the elderly persons would be asking, you think we will get that money before we die? You think I'll see that money before I die? It It was always about the money issue. Will we get it? Particularly um, from the standpoint of Chuck, Chuck just, um, Calypso, which I think has been misinterpreted about um, collecting our grandfather back um, on the last Friday of every month. But the young people, whether at St. Mary's College, the convent, or the comprehensive schools um, that we went to around the island, to a person, the young persons would say to us, but how come that's not in our books? How come we never learned that? Let us have the links. How can we get the books? Where can we get the movies? We weren't even yet into WhatsApp and all of that, which, is, which makes it much easier now. But I think that distinct difference continues to exist. And um, what we need to do, like um, Ambassador Sumer said, is to take all of it as a bouillon. You know, these are all ingredients of the bouillon that we call reparations. And um, we have to see the, even the questions that surprise us as genuine questions. And in as much as we might not have expected them to have been delivered in that way or in that form, they are genuine questions. And we look forward to many more of those types of genuine questions coming out of this consultation, not only because, like I said, we're talking about money, and people will want to know, like Ambassador said, um, whether the money is going to go in the treasury for the, the government of the day uh, to use, or whether it is going to go in the hands of a, a, a neutral body with a long-term mandate of guaranteeing non-interference uh, by administrations. Uh, to what extent we might want to ask, was the battle report um, did it take into consideration Sir Arthur Lewis's um, formula for assessment of reparations? As in his first book in 1939, uh, um, which, which has been adopted as the blueprint for reparations. And on the 1st of August 2020, the Caribbean community adopted the Sir Arthur Lewis formula as one to follow. So we may want to find out as part of the discussions to what extent Sir Arthur's um, formula was considered by the authors of the Brattle Report in coming to a conclusion. Um, this is not to suggest that they ignored, um, but it would be good to know to what extent um, Sir Arthur's formula 82 years ago or more than that apply or would apply today because it was not based on um, just the values of the day um, but it is a document labor in the west indies 1939 by w arthur lewis um, what it indicates is uh, that this is a formula that can be applied you know you know, in time immemorial, because it is not based on the dates and times, but based on a formula. Um, are there any other questions, or do we have any other comments online? Oh, yes, we have another question. Can we give her the mic? Oh, yes, sorry, go ahead. Um, I need to sit, so that's fine. Um, oh, I lost the point I was going to make. All right. What we historically we have not been teaching history. So that a lot of young people are growing up not knowing the history of the Caribbean. And we need to consider what is in the mind space of our Caribbean young people. Is there space to consider all those things that you're talking about that they have never learned and they're hearing for the first time? I'm coming to the point of whether you need to be in the schools to do something about the teaching of history and making people familiar with those historical circumstances so that the main mind space of the Caribbean child will hold some of those things 
and therefore have a different kind of response to what you're trying to um, I learned history when I was at school. <laughs> I learned history, but I never learned our history. And that is, that was, that's a challenge. It wasn't until I went to university that I really started to learn my own history. I learned the same thing that Joyce Lynn learned, that it was the white people who freed us. I didn't learn that we had attacked the enslavement system so much that they were forced to give us freedom, otherwise we would take it like it. I didn't learn about the black abolitionists in England who were involved in writing the Emancipation Act. I didn't learn about maroon societies where free African people lived. In, but we had it in a different form in St. Lucia, the Negmawan. So anytime you behave badly, they would call you a Negmawan because we learned that the people who rebelled or the people who tried to take their freedom, the freedom fighters, a rebellious person or a person trying to get his freedom, was supposed to be a freedom fighter. We felt sorry when the enslaved rebelled and burnt the house of the planter. Look at what they did to the white people. You understand? That is the colonial mindset that was entrenched within the history that I learned. So, maybe we need to start afresh. I have heard on many different occasions, politicians speak to the fact that we need to teach history in school. At this stage, I'm tired. Because you can do it tomorrow if you want to. It's there. The information is there. You have to put it into a curriculum. Who is going to do it? You know? Maybe people who have never learned history and don't understand what they should be teaching in the school. We need to do it properly. We need to do it properly. The National Reparations Com Committee has gone into the school to speak to the issue of reparations, as Earl said. We have gone. It's COVID interrupted, but even then, we did, we did um, consultations online with not only young people in St. Lucia, but in the region, online. So we have had education programs. And, um, but it's not enough. It's not enough. You know, it has to be, we have to take a more strategic and sustainable approach to doing it. So people like me, Earl will call me all the time to assist, but it is a small committee. We want all of you all. One of the reasons why I do these lectures is because I want more women on board with this reparations thing, you know. I think if women took control of it, that we would, it would be more widespread. We'd speak about it in our homes, amongst our families, etc etc i think that um, the reparations movement has not attracted women the way it should and more women and that's why i do so many reparations lectures about women and women enslaved women not that i am discounting at all enslaved men i just want it to be a fuller picture i want the specificity of women in the history so I don't want history to be taught in any haphazard way in our schools. And I am here. I'm willing. I am able. Any other questions? Yes? Yeah, the voice of the Rasta man. Yes, Rasta man. Yes. We've been at the focal point of reparations. And I want persons in the world to know they should not, the 
we shouldn't at all disregard our contribution to the world at large as the Rastafari community. Because we were in the forefront of reparations and crying for reparations from day one, from existence. We cried, we cried, we cried, we cried, we cried. We cried, we cried, we cried, we cried. But finally, our cries were heard. And all over the world, we hearing about reparations, reparations, reparations. And I'm happy to be here today to witness the lunch and this lecture of the battle report. It's very interesting. It has a lot to offer. But at the end of all, we have to do it together. Because we've been clowering all the time and people now respecting our voice. And the United Nations is saying, do not underestimate the contribution of the Rastaman. And I'm saying to this, the reason why the group is not in chaos or top security today is because of our contribution. And we will not stop there. We will support every aspect of reparations, even reparatory justice in-house. Yes, because we have suffered the brunt of what we call reparations. I'm happy to be on board with the Regents Committee on behalf of the Archaeological and Historical Society, which came into existence in 1954. I'm happy when people talk about his local history in schools. It's time. It's overdue. As the General Secretary for the St. Lucia Archaeological and Historical Society, I spoke with the Prime Minister when we had the only emancipation activity in St. Lucia in 2021 at the Annex at the Anglican community. They came the Prime Minister, he visited the exhibition, and we said to him, we need to be focused. We need to have our histories taught in the schools. Rest assured, we will do it. We're beginning to work on it already. And our society is working towards that goal. Because without our history, without where we're from and where we're heading to, we are always doomed to fail. And that's what it leads to. So I can assure this lady that made mention of history in schools, yes. Because we cannot be teaching the foreign history and not our history. When it comes to our indigenous rights as individuals and as communities, yes, it's very important because the Maroons played a major role as indigenous people. We should work towards establishment of our marine communities in St. Lucia, yes, and beyond. And I'm saying to the globe that we are alive and we continue to work towards the ultimate goal is reparation and also reparatory justice and also healing which comes with reparatory justice and reparations. Thank you. We acknowledge the, the, the work Reparations has gone through many phases, as I said in the, pre in the presentation, and the phase in which the Rastafarians um, really stepped forward and, and put it on the map, um, and, the, and the call for repatriation also is something that is well noted and documented. And so we continue to acknowledge that, and, and a lot of the, the repatriation movements in Africa at this time have to do with some of, a lot of the work of the Rastafarians. So um, we acknowledge them and other groups, the Pan-Africanists, etc., who have been very involved in ensuring that each phase of the movement is strengthened. Thank you so much. You, you have gone to university and you've sat with groups at universities. And you know that Africans on a whole look at us in the Caribbean as not Africans. I personally have a problem with 
when Africa, when Caribbean people talk about Africa as their motherland and getting going back there, when Africans themselves do not recognize us as Africans, you know that I've sat on several universities that I've attended and I've gone through that same problem because we are mixed and we are not, while African is one of our predominant um, genes, it has been mixed up. Look at you. You I'm, are an um, Indian. I am a woman of African descent. I declare and identify. Yes, you're African descent, and <laughs> but you look like the Indian in your East Indian in your family. No East Indian will ever accept me as an East Indian. Right. The East Indian will never accept you, though you look more like them, but they are part of your genes. And you look more like the East Indian because your mother was East Indian. But the Africans that you and I are African descent, and I look more like them, although I have very strong Caucasian and East Indian in my family, yet they do not accept us because we are mixed. Because we are cooped. What do you call us? The rate that was going on during my doctoral studies was that we are, a, we are calico. And this is a very real thing for a lot of Caribbean students who are faced, or young people who are faced with Africans, when we are asking to return, and with what Africa is doing, making it easy, the trade thing, for Caribbean people to come into Africa now, to move into Africa, you know about that movement. So they're opening the doors. And then of one of the things that the Rastafarian community has been pushing is going back to the motherland, you know? And they have problems with that because uh, we have problems with it while the, Afri the, um, the Rastafarian community do not, but we have a problem with it because the Africans do not accept us and we are mixed up with different races, which is a reality, it's a fact. So how can you tell somebody who knows that they are a mixed up and the place where they are pushing as the motherland is not accepting you as African, how do you answer? Because this, these are real questions. We can't bury our heads in the sand and pretend it does not exist. It exists. It is there. So that's what I want to ask. No, I can answer the question. Um, I know that we, we have run out of time, but I can deal with that question um, in short piece. Um, first of all, I don't know that Africans don't recognize us as Africans. Africa is a continent, and you may have encountered people from different parts that do not recognize you as an African because you are mixed. As Africa is a mosaic. Africa is mixed also. So they might have encountered people who, in the first place, resented that um, people of African descent um, people of African descent probably see themselves, it might have been our attitude also, we see ourselves as better than Africans because they, there is this feeling that Africa is not, and we don't want to be part of something that we have seen in the press, a backward country, a backward, and they use it, they say a country as if Africa is a country and not a continent. Okay? Africa is as diverse as any, and even more diverse than any other continent. It is because there is self-hate. It is the colonized mind. We think that what we came out of is not good enough for us to go back. Until you step into Africa and you see what is happening in Africa. Africa is the fastest growing continent in the world. GDP of Africa over the last 10 years has been 7 and more percent. Why do you think the Europeans are flocking back to Africa? Why do you think the Chinese are going? Unless we understand, that is what Wisely was speaking about. The self-healing that we need to undertake for us to understand what Africa is and what is in us as people of African descent, we will always think of ourselves as mixed. Every nation is mixed. The first human beings were Africans. So the white people also have some genetic, you know, 
trees. They will go to New York. They are born in New York. And after centuries, they will tell you that I am originally from Ireland or I am from my families from Germany. We are the only group of people who do not want to walk to accept that Africa is the motherland. We are the only group because we do not understand. We have been so colonized. And that is not only us in the Caribbean, but also people in Africa. So those who you encounter also have that. There are many successful repatriation programs in Africa right now. Very many successful. There is progress being made on the sixth region of Africa, which is the African diaspora. People don't know these things, and so they say these things. I am saying that we really need to educate people. We really need to educate for them not to, you know, tell me that I have good hair because my mother was an East Indian. Nonsense. There are people in Africa with better hair than me. If it's better hair you're looking for. But what is wrong with anybody else's hair inside of hair because it does not look like mine? What is good hair? You know, these are the things that we sell and divide ourselves. You, nobody's going to separate me from what I believe. Andre, we want to thank. Um, we have a time period that we are online, and um, remember, this is the beginning of a year-long consultation. And the issues that are raised here, we can agree to disagree on until we are able to work them out. But I think what we have just um, heard is one of the reasons why Dr. Sumer is the chair designate of the uh, permanent <coughs> forum for people of African descent of the United Nations. So folks, we're running out of time. Before we go into our uh, vote of thanks, um, I would like to introduce a bit of a a bit of a surprise element here because um, after 10 years, the National Reparations Committee has not been able to find ways to, find ways, uh, to earn a budget or a subvention. But we have kept our heads above water and um, we have gone down um, in the history of the CARICOM Reparations Commission as one of the uh, more active National Reparations Committees. And there are individuals here this evening, members of the uh, National Reparations Committee representing entities uh, that have gone, um, gone abroad, as we would say, and, and out of their way to ensure and to accommodate us. And here, where we are this evening, uh, is one of uh, those entities. But before we go to the open campus, I would like to uh, present on the global campus. Um, I would like to, uh, on behalf of the National Reparations Committee, make a presentation to Monsignor Dr. Patrick Anthony, who has been a member, uh, a founding member of our committee and um, he has not been a member of our committee as the chair of the Folk Research Center named after himself. He's there in his capacity as he always describes himself as first a Caribbean man and secondly as a priest. An appreciation for your contributions um, from day one and your continuing contributions, Monsignor Anthony, uh, we would like to uh, donate or present this token of appreciation uh, from the uh, National Reparations Committee. Um, if you don't mind, we could uh, let everybody see what you're getting, which is uh, a, a bottle appropriate with your dress and your mission on our behalf. <laughs> um, um, earlier today we presented one to Dame Paulette Louise and um, um, she did note that when she held it it felt empty 
and I had to tell her that um, it contained, it, it, the contents are under pressure uh, because it contains, it con it's a bottle full of St. Lucian sunshine. So don't open it. Um, secondly, I'd like to invite um, Ambassador Sumo to join me um, so that we could make a presentation uh, to, <coughs> sorry, to the head of the uh, local unit which started off as the UE Open Campus here, one of the places where we had our very first activity. And uh, the then Open Campus was the and continues to be an entity that has done everything to accommodate everything that we have asked them to do as part of us. And Leslie Queen Mitchell, as the head of the local unit, has always been uh, open to um, ensuring that our requests are met. And I would like to ask um, Ambassador Suma, who is also the chair of the global campus subsequent to our cooperation with the open campus. Um, so we would like to ask Ambassador Suma to hand uh, this bottle over to uh, Leslie Crane Mitchell. Leslie, the um, global campus that deserves all the sunshine it can get at this time. <laughs> we too have been under pressure like the sunshine in this bottle. But despite that, you all have always stepped forward to help the NRC. Um, I cannot think of an occasion when we called on you, whether it's a meeting we have in an emergency meeting, a lecture or anything that you and your team have not facilitated us. And we could only undertake the kind of education program that we have undertaken, both in the schools and in the public, because of the global campus. And it's not because I'm the chair. It is because of the commitment that the team here um, has demonstrated over the last few years. So thank you very much. And we look forward to continuing our good work with you. Thank you, Ambassador Sumo. And um, our final, um, final tick tonight, we want to invite another member of the National Reparations Committee, um, the representative on uh, the Committee of the Archaeological and Historical Society, Brother Emmanuel, is going to do the vote of thanks. I want to say good night to once and once. It's a great pleasure to thank each and every one that made this event a success. I want to thank especially Dr. Suma for her presentation. I want to thank everyone online that were patient and listened and made contribution to the success of this event. Also, I want to thank each and every one that made the duty to be here today, to be part of that activity and made contributions towards that event. I want to thank you all, and I want to thank the Mosai Jairastafari for giving us that privilege. Thank you very much, one and all.